Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us with yet another OWASP Spotlight Series. And this is the 15th project that we are taking up. I'm sure you must have seen the 14 projects that have, uh, that have been covered so far. If not, go check out the channel. Uh, we have covered 14 important projects which are part of open source community OWASP, which is Open Web Application Security Project. Now, this project is very, very important when we talk about dependencies. We have seen a lot of uh, attacks that are surfacing. And another important aspect, if I have to tell you that uh, this project have created a market which was never there before. And this was needed, but people were not aware that this can be used uh, for checking the dependencies. So let me welcome Sp uh, Steve, who is the uh, project leader for dependency track. And every time I speak about this project, there's something new to learn about it. Like it covers huge amount of things. Now I will stop here. I will let Steve talk about the project more because he is the, the creator behind the project. He's the motivator behind the project. Over to you, Steve. Thanks for having me. Uh, always, always, uh, uh, you know, uh, happy to talk about one of my, one of my favorite topics. Um, dependency track at a very high level is um, yes, it can, it can, handle the, the consumption and analysis of all your, your third party uh, dependencies, but it does a lot more than, than just that. It actually operates on the concept of software bill of materials or SBOMs. And SBOMs is essentially a list of your ingredients. Um, my software has this. Um, and if you are building things in a CI CD pipeline, um, that's going to be fairly elementary, right? M most uh, SCA tools do that type of analysis today. Where it gets a lot more complex is when you start introducing a, a much more to your stack, right? My application is then distributed in this Docker container or some other thing, or it runs on this piece of hardware, right? So when you actually ship software in the real world, um, it has to run somewhere and you can actually describe that entire, that entire stack uh, using a software bill of material. So it's really, different type of approach to something that SCA has done for a very long time. But um, with SBOMs, it's interesting because not only can you do it for your, for your first party code that you're producing, but now I can, through my procurement process, I can reach out to my suppliers. I, I'm evaluating software for, you know, maybe I want to buy some software. Well, I, now I can get SBOMs from those suppliers and, uh, and ingest those into dependency tracks. And now I know what the risk is going to be if I actually buy that piece of software or if I acquire this particular company. Which is, I think, uh, very, very important and needed at this time. And I have read that it covers a lot of aspects, even it covers uh, certificates and whatnot. So can you please throw some light on it? Or if we can see a demo of the, uh, the tool, that'll be really great. Sure, yeah, software bill materials are interesting. One of the things, for example, that, that you can do with them, and it's actually a common pattern, right? How many, how many times have you, have you seen software that, is, uh, that doesn't talk to the outside world, that doesn't update, that doesn't talk to some microservice? Um, the answer is probably very little, right? Yeah, there's some software that, that is you know, in isolation, but the majority of software that we run talks to other things. So one of the interesting things with software bill of materials, which is supported with dependency track today, is that you can actually describe the services that your, that your, uh, that your software actually uses. For example, if I have a component, but it doesn't actually do anything, it's just a wrapper around some microservice, I'm, I'm making a REST API call, well, I can actually describe that service in my SBOM and that service can be part of my dependency graph. So now I get a much more holistic view of, of what the risk actually is. And, and I'm going to throw this out to the community and you can do some really interesting things because when you're talking about services, um, you can now describe the endpoints that the application actually relies on. You can describe uh, the data classification and what direction that data is is passing, and you can you know uh, describe if it 
uh, surpasses any passes any trust boundaries or, or requires any kind of authentication. So there's some really interesting things that you can get with a, a full SBOM that you can't typically get with traditional SCA products today. Okay, so this is the very first thing that you're going to see when you log into Dependency Track. Uh, just a a council of, of what's actually going on. So we are measuring risk across all of your applications in your environment. So one of the, one of the things that Dependency Track is, is trying to answer, uh, which many, many organizations struggle with, is, okay, I have this, this vulnerable component that I've heard about in the news. Am I affected by it? And if so, where in my environment am I affected? Uh, because that's where I want to spend my resources. So dependency track can, can uh, help you answer these types of questions. Um, like a lot of products, we, we group everything into projects. Each project, you can think of a project as essentially a container of, of uh, inventory. A project could be an operating system. It could be an IoT or medical device. It could be a, a microservice that your organization has created. Um, I'm going to go on to one of these uh, services here, a lot of dummy data right here, but uh, you'll see the, the number of vulnerabilities, critical high, medium lows over time. You'll see any kind of policy violations, but you can go into your inventory um, this way, and it'll tell you whether or not you have vulnerable components or not, uh, how many uh, are vulnerable. It'll tell you if the components are out of date or not. Uh, one of the original use cases was manual, um, uh, manual assessment. So I have a bill of material. Maybe I got it from a supplier, for example, and you know it's not tied into my CI/CD pipeline. How can I get that into the dependency track very easily? Well, you can actually upload the bill of material through the user interface this way. Obviously, if you're deploying this in your own environment, you would want to integrate this with your CI/CD pipeline. If this application relied on any types of services, we talked about the like the REST or, or uh, functional services, uh, those would be listed here. Um, dependency graph, this example is bad, but um, we do have, for example, a complete audit log, for example, where I can go into each one of these, each one of these things and make comments or mark the analysis as uh, not applicable or exploitable or Whatever, whatever the case is. If something is, is truly like a false positive, you can also then optionally suppress it. Um, we also support policy violations. So let me just roll over to uh, policy management, for example. And I've got some policies created already. It looks like I've got one uh, policy where uh, I am prohibiting Apache struts. So, um, you know, that is above my risk threshold as an organization. So I want to fail on, 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 those, types of, um, on those types of projects. But I also have maybe some prohibited licenses, right? And in this case, I've got a group of licenses called copy left that I'm prohibiting. And uh, I don't necessarily want to break a build because of this, but I do wanna, I do wanna notify folks. So I've got this set in a warning state. So again, one of the things that we can, uh, we want to ask with dependency track is what is affected and where? So uh, let's, let's try to, uh, you can search on a bunch of different things, including coordinates. You can search on package URL. You can actually search on hashes and a few other fields, but uh, let's, let's try to find struts, for example. Do I have struts in here? No, I do not. Um, what is vulnerable that, uh, let's see. Oh, Angular, JS, four, okay. So let's find out where, where in my environment that thing actually resides. So if this was a vulnerable package and, um, um, I, I want to be able to, to, to see where in my environment uh, this particular component is found. Uh, so this tells me that this particular component is found in this particular project. Now, many instances of dependency track, um, they, 
uh, installations typically have thousands or tens of thousands of projects. And each of these projects could be representative of first party code or uh, in many cases, third party code, right? Things that I have uh, acquired through a, 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 from a supplier or maybe I've paid an outside consultancy to develop something for me, which they have delivered along with a software bill of materials. So in an actual enterprise, you're gonna have thousands or tens of thousands of projects. So being able to do this kind of search to identify where in your environment something is actually impacted is going to be um, really helpful when that new CVE that has a shiny new logo and, and marketing website comes out. <laughs> So, um, you know, think of Heartbleed or, or any of those types of, of vulnerabilities. We can also go through it the opposite way, right? So if we are interested in a, uh, in a vulnerability, for example, this NPM vulnerability, um, I, I know that there is one project actually impacted by this vulnerability. And I can go into that vulnerability and see exactly what projects are impacted by this. So again, if I do have that, that new vulnerability with that shiny new logo and marketing website that's making the news, I can go in, query dependency track and know exactly where in my environment uh, I'm actually potentially impacted by that. As an OWASP project, uh, we are very agnostic to the sources of vulnerability intelligence. Uh, we support some free types uh, directly from the NVD, we support Sonatype uh, OSS index, uh, and we support um, NPM advisories. Uh, so all of those sources of, of Vone Intel are free. On the commercial side, uh, it currently supports Vone DB from risk-based security, but we're also going to be integrating and have plans to integrate some with some commercial sources of, uh, of Vone Intel from uh, multiple SCA vendors. So uh, given the fact that most SCA products do not do this type of don't have this type of capability today. Um, many organizations still have these services. So uh, we can potentially reuse existing uh, Vone Intel from the SCA vendors to power dependency track. And last but not least, uh, we have a list of licenses. So, um, you know, license and license policies obviously are a thing. But we, uh, if you want to do some research into what licenses you, you may or may not want in your environment, uh, this actually gives you kind of a tool to be able to do that. For example, you can go into, uh, um, for example, maybe you want to do some research on the AGPL, right? You can go in here, uh, go to the license, and actually start reading all about it. So Dependency Track has about 400 or 500 or so open source licenses, all cataloged with this type of data in there. So it gives your legal team the ability to go in there, do the necessary research, and then make some policies that, um, that can um, uh, you know, help protect your organization from, from license risk. So with that, So you can monitor all the licenses, everything at one place, right? You can. Oh, perfect. So how easy or difficult is to download the product? Like where exactly can people go ahead and start downloading it? Absolutely. So dependency track, the easiest way to get started um, is Docker. Docker is your friend. Um, Dependencytrack.org is where you would go to, to grab it. Um, you can grab the latest version, uh, enter these commands, and you're up and running. Uh, we support Docker Compose, Docker Swarm, and uh, there are community uh, implementations to support Helm charts for Kubernetes. Oh, that's, that's really amazing. I think it's easy to download, easy to use, and anyone can use it. And let's say if somebody wants to donate to the project, how can they do it? Absolutely. Um, so um, documentation, any, ki any kind of contributions are, 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 are encouraged. So anything from ideas to obviously pull requests. We are open source. It's Apache 2.0 license. Pull requests are highly encouraged. But even things as, 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 as small as documentation updates or, or these types of things, answering um, 
answering questions in the Slack channel, for example, these are, these are all really, really good contributions. So the more organizations uh, adopt, uh, we, we found that the, 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 they are able to contribute, but it's really, really interesting in the fact that it's unlike most OWASP tools, it's more of an enterprise type tool. And because of that, we, we've, we've gotten a, a fewer code contributions than, uh, than other OWASP projects. But any contribution is is highly highly encouraged and um, and highly valuable. Um, we do have a, a a fairly active Slack channel as well. It's hosted in the uh, the OWASP Slack workspace. I think that's going to be really amazing. I'm just going to post all these details in the channel so that they can go ahead and look at it. Thank you so much, Steve, for joining me today. It was such a pleasure speaking with you and talking about this very important project. Yeah, thanks for having me and thanks for thanks for for highlighting this project. Truly appreciate it. Thank you so much.